Welcome to Talk The Line. I'm Jen Long and every week I chat to an artist, musician or celeb about what gets them excited. We talk for around 45 minutes about the stuff you don't normally get to hear on the traditional album press cycle. This is a podcast from the line of Best Fit, the UK's biggest independent website for new music discovery. You can check us out at thelineofbestfit.com and you can follow us on Twitter at Talk The Line and me at Jen Long. If you like this podcast, please subscribe. And this week, we have a real treat for you. I'm talking to Martine McCutcheon. Actress and singer Martine McCutcheon is something of a British institution. She rose to fame in the BBC soap EastEnders before releasing Perfect Moment, arguably the greatest pop ballad of the 20th century. I'm putting it out there. Many will know her role in Love Actually, a modern Christmas classic, which she reprised for this year's Children in Need. Martine is back this year after a 17-year absence from music with a new album called Lost and Found. It's a deeply personal record with themes that cover everything from relationships to the way she's been affected by the debilitating Lyme disease. We met Martine to delve into history and talk about another national institution, Henry VIII. It's more sort of like that I have a fascination with him as opposed to I'm an expert on him. No, that, that's great though, because I mean, mm. I was quite surprised when you, when you said Henry VIII, I, I thought you'd have gone with Queen Victoria. Ah, but, um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, I've been practising that one for like days. Boom, boom. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> but honestly, I was telling people in the office, I was like, yeah, I'm going to interview Martine McCutcheon and like her specialist subject is Henry VIII. And people were like, what? Wait, what? It's yeah. like, no, yeah. It's funny, isn't it? I think people kind of like only associate you with what they want to associate you with. Yeah. And so it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's always nice when you sort of get to go, no, I know about something else other than, you know, pie and mash and fish and <laughs> chips and the East End. That's why there's a bigger life out there, people. <laughs> so when did your Henry VIII fascination start? It started as a child. Um, mm. Basically, for me, um, anyone that can change religion because he fancies somebody <laughs> is a pretty potent character and um, a real fascination. And uh, I also really was a bit fascinated by the Tudor times, and he was a second Tudor monarch. And he was, um, he, I just found uh, his kind of ability just to be able to do whatever he wanted absolutely fascinating. Yeah, because you, you think of you know um, the monarchy as being sort of so rigid in, and having so many rules and a lot of unhappiness because of those rules. Mm. And Henry VIII just chucked it all out the window, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> so what age were you? You were kind of so teenager. I was about I was about kind of um, ten. Wow. Yeah, I was about ten years old when I first got fascinated. I could not believe that a monarch had married six times. And then chopped some of their heads off. And chopped some of their heads off. I mean, my real um, fascination of the women around him was definitely Anne Boleyn. Yeah. You know, she just seems like a, a really um, mysterious creature. And the fact that they said to me she had an extra finger. What? I Did didn't you not know, know this? No. Yeah, she had a, a sixth um, limb finger, whatever you want to call it, yeah. Um, was it a finger? No, she's got a thumb, one, two, three, four fingers, yeah. So she had a fifth finger, but you know what right, I mean? I see what you mean, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was getting a bit confused about. But yeah, so she had an extra finger, and a lot of people thought she was kind of a bit witch-like. But she was right. apparently absolutely stunning, and mm. he kind of uh, clocked, her, clocked eyes on her in the court, and um, that was it. He wanted her to be his, and changed, you know, religion to be with her. Because mm. he, at the time, he was married to Catherine, Catherine of Aragon. Who yeah. was previously his brother's wife? Oh, it's all very incestuous. It's so much like Game of Thrones. Oh my god, but it's better. unbelievable. But yeah, and um, and he, yeah, he was with her, and they had Mary, mm -hmm. and uh, he desperately wanted a son, and he was convinced that Anne would give him that son, and she was convinced too, and little did they know that Elizabeth would be far from a disappointment. Elizabeth the first. That, that she would be one of the greatest reigning monarchs ever. Um, and um, yeah, so he, he kind of uh, beheaded um, Anne because it was kind of rumoured that she'd said things that were inappropriate about him. 
But whether it was that or whether it was that he just had enough of her and wanted a son, we'll never know. Right, okay. Mm. So he had two daughters, yes. I think Mary and Elizabeth? Yes, Mary and Elizabeth, Elizabeth okay. I. Were they both with Anne Boleyn? And no, so so uh, I think Mary was from Catherine of Aragon. Right, okay. And uh, Elizabeth I was with Anne Boleyn. And then after Anne, um, he was with Jane Seymour. Who died after... After giving him this son. Was and apparently he was, dev- he was devastated. Yeah. I think it was Edward. Was it, oh, Edward, that was it. Yeah. Edward VI. Yeah, I'm not good with the numbers. No. I, but it was Ed. Yeah, Ed. We'll call him Ed for now. King Good, Ed. good old Eddie. <laughs> Um, and uh, he was quite a sickly child and um, passed away very young and apparently Henry VIII was absolutely devastated when Jane died. I think she had blood clots or blood it was, complications, it was, was it? was only a few days after she'd given birth. Yeah, yeah. And he'd been, oh no, it was Anne Boleyn when he was in the, the jousting accident. Well, I'm, getting, I'm getting my wives confused now. It's easily done. <laughs> it is. It is easily done. But he had a great love affair and passion for Anne Boleyn, and that's why I think as well he was so furious with her and decided to behead her so publicly. Um, and she never really got a chance to sort of defend herself or speak for herself. And then Jane, compared to Anne, kind of is portrayed as kind of quite an insipid character. Um, very gentle, very sweet, but not very strong. Right. And um, and he loved her for very different reasons, and obviously she gave him the air in Edward. And then when she died, he was apparently heartbroken over that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Edward didn't live to be king either. So it kind of, yeah, it was... It he was, didn't live to be king. I thought he was... I thought he was like going to be king, but he was too young to be king. That's when, right. When so, so he died very young, so right. he never ended up having the full shebang of mm. reigning the country and then it was elizabeth so then in the meantime <laughs> you've got moving on to the wives after jane seymour you've got anna cleves now she wasn't a looker right she wasn't a looker he didn't marry because he fancied her or anything like that it was for political reasons yeah um and uh he realized after a kind of quite a short period of time that it wasn't going to do politically what he thought he was going to do okay and um, and he hadn't met her, had he? Someone no. had gone and painted a portrait of her and brought it back, but they'd kind of <laughs> taken a bit of. It's basically like it's basically like the modern Artistic day liberties. version of, of like putting a screenshot up of Sienna Miller, <laughs> when really we all know you're not. <laughs> and um, and that's what happened with this portrait for for Henry. Listen, who needs drunk history? I just say it all sober. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's brilliant. Say it in layman's terms. She wasn't a looker. <laughs> she <All> wasn't. Right. <laughs> I feel like we're rushing through the wives too quickly because uh, uh, Catherine of Aragon is such a fascinating story. Mm. And that, that marriage was annulled. But to annul the marriage, he formed the Church of England. He separated yes. the, the two churches because it was under... Yes. Sorry, I jumped onto Anne Boleyn because I'm so fascinated by her. But yes, what he did for her was basically change religion, basically stop being Catholic and say, right, we are now a Church of England country because I really fancy this woman. And the monarch is in charge of the... Is t- was at the time in charge of the well, church? Well, he, he had to persuade a lot of, you know, the powers that be, and he managed to do it. Mm. He managed to do it. He managed to get his way. It's amazing what a man will do when he's sexually charged. <laughs> it, yeah. So it was, it, he, you know, all joking aside, like, he was a really, really kind of headstrong man um, and very, very driven by his passions and, um, and a bit of a slave to his emotions in some ways, which you think in some ways would make him quite a weak monarch. Mm. Um, and in some ways he was, but in other ways, you know, he was just like absolutely driven that he was going to have Anne and that was it. And um, and it caused chaos. Yeah, because he was something like fourth in line to the throne at birth. Mm. And then all his brothers and sisters, I, I, I presume, kept dying. Yes. And it was his elder brother who was first married to Catherine of Aragon. That's right. And then... And then he kind of like... He died. Yes, and so he got her... But um, he was super young at the time, right? He was like... He, he was, he was really young and um, never, never, I don't think he ever expected to be king. Yeah. You know, there were too many of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it was, um, it was a real um, shock and I don't think it was something that 
uh, he innately felt like he would ever need to be was king. Yeah. Um, and I think he wasn't of the disposition. I don't think of 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 uh, of what we would expect our king to be. He just didn't have that kind of personality. He was a rebel. Yeah. It's something I was reading. Something like how he was kind of because he was so young when he first you know became king or became I don't know in, exactly in power. how old he was but he was really young and they sort of kept him back away from the public and kind of schooled him in private so when he did become public facing king he didn't have any of the usual diplomatic tendencies that one might have no no he didn't he wasn't he there were so many ways that he just wasn't equipped or ready mm-hmm. um because obviously who would have thought that that many of your siblings yeah would pass away before they became and then he was just there, he was king, he was married to this woman that he didn't really want to be married to. No. And he fancied a pal. Yeah. What are you going to yeah. do? He inherited her. He inherited yeah. Catherine of Aragon and was kind of like, oh, this isn't what I had in mind. I quite like the ladies. <laughs> yeah. You know. And yeah, he, um, thought, he thought he was going to get to be, you know, Prince Harry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he thought he was going to have his cake and eat it. Yeah. He really did. And, um, and it just, it, you know, it just did not work out that way. And... But he just wasn't going to let the fact, you know, the fact that he was, you know, just a king of the country, he wasn't going to let that stop him kind of (laughs) being with who he wanted to be with. And he, um, like I said, I do think he was seriously kind of quite an emotional king. Mm. I think from what I can gather and from what I've watched and from what I've read, he does very much seem to um, be um, very driven by his heart and his emotions and his lust and his passion. And he will literally move heaven and earth to be with the woman he wants to be with and you know you think after a while you know it become kind of a bit of a joke within court the amount of times that he got married but it just didn't just didn't stop him no so he got he he went to the pope and he was like a normal marriage yeah i'm not into it yeah and the pope was like no way you're married <laughs> He was like, fine I love then. What we're talking about this. Is this how everybody else talks about their, their subjects? <laughs> uh, is it quite conversational? Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. that what we do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're just, it's just us having a chat. You know, we don't want you know to... what's a really weird dynamic? It's just having a chat about something that's sort of so um, historical. Yeah, it's just I like, love it. It's good, isn't it? I mean, if you want, we could talk about your new album, but <laughs> <laughs> and that we'll get to that. But um, but no, he, I do, I do, I literally have a real resonance with him, and we haven't got to all his wives yet. But I've actually, I'm actually moving to Hampton Court. What? Yeah. Amazing. So um, we've got a house. That I literally can walk to the palace in five minutes, and I've always walked past the palace along by the river. Um, I just feel this sense of. I don't know happiness and contentedness whenever I'm 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 around that area, um, and I've done a lot of my thinking and a lot of my sorting out my problems just walking up and down the river, and going past the palace. I go ice skating there at Christmas with the family, <laughs> and I'm just like wow, kind of all went on there, you know. Um, would you call yourself a royalist? Yeah, I would. Yeah, because that's not a very cool thing to no, say. No, I'm age. a lot of things that aren't cool though, <laughs> and I kind of think that's cool because it's not cool. So I, I kind a of developed a bit of a, a bit of a passion for the royal family in recent years yeah. after watching a made-for-TV movie called oh. William and Kate. Ah, oh, yes. That I sort of watched ironically <laughs> at first, but then, <laughs> then you fell really in love with it. <laughs> you really got into it. I mean, you know, they've, I've always, I've always been a royalist. I'm, I'm, you know, very um, proud of the country, and I think that our royal family is kind of what separates us and makes us a bit different from a lot of other countries and I love our history I'm so proud of it as checkered as it it may be um I think it's fascinating and something we should be honored to talk about and proud of and um and just the you couldn't make it up no you could not make up what's happened to our royal family over hundreds and hundreds of years it's just better than anything you could ever make up on tv yeah, that is true. This story in particular. Yeah. Do you think he's one of the best monarchs in, in terms of the drama? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you've had others that have abdicated, but I mean, it's for one wife, it's not for six. Yeah. You know, that, that he's like, he, he didn't. He didn't abdicate, he didn't step down. He was like, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm going to have the wives, I'm going <laughs> to have it all. I'm going to split the church. Yeah. I'm going to cause absolute mayhem out there. 
I mean, that's and quite romantic, isn't it? To change religion just so that you can have the woman that you want. She must have been quite a woman, Anne. Yeah. Well, she's supposed to be quite, quite an intellectual force. Yes. I mean, some people say that she was very manipulative. And other people just say that she just had this kind of magical quality about her that pretty much everyone who met her was kind of a bit mesmerised by her. And she was gorgeous, but she wasn't like amazingly beautiful, but she just had this something mm. that, um, that, in the words of George Harrison, she just had this something about her that um, people were absolutely captivated by. Um, and he obviously had like a certain thing that he liked because later on with Catherine Howard, um, she was her cousin and kind of a more beautiful version of Anne Boleyn and he, she got beheaded too. Oh gosh, we haven't come on to the beheading because it's quite a tragic story. Yeah, so um, after Anna Cleves, uh, as we were saying, she was no oil painting <laughs> and, um, and then uh, Catherine Howard was, was beautiful. Absolutely stunning, apparently. But just going back to Anne Boleyn, it's, yeah. it's like it's actually really sad when you look into it because she had like a series of miscarriages, and then she gave birth to a daughter. Yes. And then when bef- she was, when she was beheaded, she was four months pregnant before the beheading. And I did not know that. Yeah, I mean, not not while she was beheaded. She was four months pregnant, and then um, Henry was in like a jousting accident. This and is the jousting one, right? Yeah, and okay. the shock of the joust made her miscarry, and uh, uh, and yes, then no, because hear this. she'd failed him again, he had her head chopped off. She must have been starting to feel like, as a woman, you kind of have a great intuition, and I think she must have felt like time was running out. Yeah, to be that stressed out, and um, and to keep losing babies, it must have been horrific to sort of kind of. He, I don't think he's the kind of man who would have hidden it very well that she was kind of skating on very thin ice. Mm. And I think that, um, I just think, I just think it's, it's so sad and so dramatic that she was beheaded. Yeah. And never had a chance to kind of say, to speak to him ever again and say, what's been said about me and the fact that you think that I've been well, they um, thought talking. she might have been a witch was one of the things that Oh, said. yeah, yeah, that yeah. was because of the extra finger. The finger, makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and, I th- and I do think he was... Um, th- there's a lot of gossip going around about him and um, about him as a man and as a lover and that kind of thing. And so I think his pride and his ego were severely dented. Right. And, um, and I think that... I think because he was so hurt and angry as well about not having a son as well as what she'd said about him she was cruising for a big horrible way to leave his life but she must have like really cared for him yeah to have that kind of physical reaction to finding out he'd been injured well their love letters to each other were absolutely beautiful for many many years they used to write each other these amazing letters um, and it was true fairy tale stuff and um and I think, um, in her own way, I think she was probably the most authentic love of his life, in the most kind of fairy tale sense of the word. Yeah. I think that Jane Seymour um, was somebody that he cared for deeply and was very sweet. But I think the passion and the love of his life that you that you see in movies was very much Anne Boleyn. Um, but as often as the case with real love, you kind of lose control. Yeah, and I think that there was an element of him that kind of didn't trust himself, didn't trust his feelings, didn't trust why he was staying with her when she kept miscarrying, when he had made it clear he wanted a son, and um, I think he kind of felt like he lost a bit of control with Anne. I think from what I can, what I've read and what I can gather, um, you do lose control when you fall in love with somebody, and I think he just sort of thought, hold on, you know, I'm meant to be getting my son here, and this isn't happening. And now all this stuff's being said, and I think that was it for him. Some some historians say that he suffered a, a head injury during mm. the jousting accident, yes. and that that might have uh, implied some of his like behaviour after after Anne Boleyn. Like mm. it might have had a, had a bearing on his kind of like wildness and how he just kept going through wives thereafter. But then you think about it: before he had the accident, he sort of changed religion for a woman. Yeah, fair. So, so fair I think point. he was kind of. A little bit, kind of, what's the word? Um, he wasn't quite hinged. Yeah, to start with. To start with, or he just didn't have, 
kind of um, that need to be anything that people thought he should be. He just didn't. He just did what he wanted. He absolutely did, and he was he was you know a real rebel within the monarchy. When you look back in history, you know what he did turn things upside down and left to right more than any you know you even think about the Windsors and nobody did it as much as Henry did and I think what an interesting like fascinating man and the women that came into his life were just as fascinating as well and I, I think it's just so hilarious the story about you know the fact that he got that oil painting of Anna Cleves and they made her out to be this gorgeous thing yeah we found the one for you <laughs> It's like when you go Bless on a you Tinder date, isn't it? it? You know, you changed religion for one, <laughs> beheaded another, lost another one who gave you your son. You've had a terrible time, but this one's an absolute beauty. You wait, here she is. Ta-da! And then she turns up and he's just like, what the hell is that? He was not happy. It's like when you go on a Tinder date and you get to the bar and you're like, oh, no, and you just turn around and walk straight back out. I want to know. Luckily, luckily, I managed to avoid that 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 time. I was settled before that all happened. But um, God, I feel for people now dating on social media. Even Henry the Eighth come unstuck. So God knows what. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not. It's not a not a most reliable source, is it? No. Not most reliable source at all. Had he already spotted Catherine Howard when? He said goodbye to Anne of Cleves. Probably. He did always seem to have one lined up, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. I think he I think he probably had. And they were all each other's ladies in waiting and part of the Well, I think I think what had happened was that I think Catherine was actually bridesmaid to Anne of Cleves. I think he is like a soap opera. Yeah. 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 And she I think she knew one of the other ones or something like that. Um, but yeah, she was around and he'd spotted her and apparently she really was a beauty. Mm. And um, so um, she definitely turned his head and then... Um, lost hers. Lost hers, yeah, because apparently she was dilly-dallying and being naughty. Well, she was. She, she, she'd previously been engaged mm-hmm. and she hired her former fiancé to, to work for her as a, a servant of some sorts. And she was also having an affair with someone else and he found out about both of them and both of those guys lost their heads too. What, the, the fiancé and the... Yeah, she was having an affair with two uh, two different guys, apparently, according to Wikipedia. Mm. See, I think that, yeah, I think she probably got a bit of a bad rap as well because pretty much Henry could invent whatever he wanted to invent. Yes, this is true. I mean, he killed off a lot of his advisors yeah. when they told him things he didn't like, of course, yeah. when he changed his mind. Yeah. And didn't he, like, he closed all the monasteries, didn't he, or dissolved all the monasteries? Oh, and then, yeah told all the monks, no, it's cool, you've got amnesty, and then killed them all. Yes. So he, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> he, was a, he was a really, really nice guy. He was a gem. Yeah, he was a gem. And he had that thing, didn't he? That, um, the ulcers on the legs. Yes, the, uh... that's from the jousting accident, apparently. Was it? Yeah, apparently he had that, that, in that accident, he gained a wound to the leg and it ulcered. And it, it, it taunted him for the rest of his life to the point where he couldn't... He couldn't walk properly. Couldn't walk properly, couldn't joust anymore, couldn't go hunting. And that's part of the reason that he got so obese in later life. That's why he got so big. I think also just he led a very extravagant lifestyle. Yeah, he was really good at that. I mean, if you're the kind of guy that will change religion to have the woman that you want, you're probably not going to be told that you need salad over a steak. No. And they kind of, you know, did used to just chew off their bun and all his jewellery and... <laughs> Kind of, you know, because I think that's the that's the Henry VIII that most people think of. Yeah, there's a wife being beheaded in the corner. He's kind got of a, a bit goblet of a Ray of wine. Winston vibe going <laughs> on. He would totally play him in a movie. Has he? I think he has oh, done. Has he? I think he. I think he has played him somewhere along the line, and I think that's quite a good fit actually. Apart from the accent, yeah, he needs to be a bit posher <laughs> for uh, old Henry VIII. But um, I think eventually all these men that kind of, these, these playboys, these naughty guys that kind of like all these women in their lives, a lot of them either just don't change or they settle down. And he settled down in the end. Yes. With Catherine Parr. Now, how did he meet Catherine Parr? What was the... I don't know. There? I don't know. How did he meet Catherine Parr? Had he already spotted her when he got the other Catherine's head chopped off? I think 
that he met Catherine Parr when um, it's quite it's quite hard to find out about her. It's quite hard to find out about how he met her. Probably just. I think she was just around. Just around. I don't know much about Catherine around Parr because more circles. right or wrong with um, with Catherine Parr, I'm not I'm not as interested in her. Yeah. Because she just survived and. <laughs> And and you know got on there's with no it. closure. No, no. She kind of just you know he was too sort of knackered by that point to do anything really awful to her. <laughs> and he got his son. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he's happy. He's content. Yeah. But then you know Elizabeth first. I mean, so he, originally she was completely disowned and written out. He she changed the laws yeah. to get yeah. rid of her. Yeah. You know, especially being Anne Boleyn's daughter. Yes. You know, he's he definitely had uh, issues with anything to do with Anne Boleyn. But then in later life, when he settled down and was a happier soul, he wrote those other... Mary and Elizabeth wrote, wrote yes. them back in. Yes. Wrote them back into the, to the line. He changed the law so he could form his own he, yeah. line to, of heirs to the throne. Yes. And um, ultimately... Um, Anne Boleyn kind of won in a way because Elizabeth did end up becoming the monarch and my god what a monarch she was. So what's some of Elizabeth the first legacy? Hmm? What's some of her legacy, Elizabeth the first? Well she was, you know, the whole the whole shebang. I mean the films that you've seen, she was just one of the most resilient, strong, um, fabulous, fascinating queens that you could ever for me she's more fascinating than Victoria yeah um, and because I know a lot about Victoria but I don't know that much about Elizabeth yeah I mean I don't know loads and loads about her but I know that she was just like her father a force to be reckoned with wow. and she was everything she could have wanted he could have wanted in a son and as a king and more yeah you know and I think that probably came from from her mother but um, but yeah I just I just I uh, just you can feel when you walk around Hampton Court. You can you still feel like the essence and the energy of that time, and it was absolutely brilliant. I walk. I've been around there a couple of times. And I'm looking at the beds and the outfits that they used to wear, and it's got a big maze as well, hasn't it? Massive maze. I could I'd get worried about that. Cause I get a bit claustrophobic. Right. So I'm frightened if I go in, I'll never come out. Quite possibly. <laughs> But you think of all the shenanigans that went on. Oh, do you think the maze was there when he lived there? Oh, I think so. Was it not? No, it probably was. I mean, King's got to have a maze. <laughs> I, love, I love how factual I am with this conversation. <laughs> and, the, and the bottom line is that, basically, I love Henry VIII. I love the fact that he had all these wives. I love the fact that he could just behead people, change religion... I love the fact that he didn't think a queen would be able to be anything he was and she was better. And that's about it, really. It's great. I think it's fascinating. So let's, ru- let's run through them. Yeah. Catherine of Aragon. Yeah, was divorced. Anne Boleyn. Beheaded. Jane Seymour. Died. Anne of Cleves. Divorced. Catherine Howard. Beheaded. Catherine Parr. Survived. I mean, that's a legacy. You, I think if I was Catherine Parr I'd have been very very nervous yeah that's also the other thing that we have not discussed like if you, if if some guy was showing his affections towards you was after you was like Martine come on a date with me and you were like you just beheaded your last wife yeah would you still go on the date well I think she could have said no this is true could she have said no because then she would have just been called a traitor and, or and then a she would have been, or then she'd have been killed anyway he could literally have any woman he wanted, and he yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he and he couldn't just you know have affairs with them. He had to marry them. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he had affairs too. He he definitely had some mistresses. Yeah, but like he seemed to marry so many of them. And but why he wanted to marry them? And do you think it was in his constant drive to have a, a son and heir? Yeah. But then even after he had Edward, hmm. he. He still kept marrying. I think that... Well, Edward died, didn't he? But I think Edward succeeded him. And then died. Really? I think so. 
I didn't think he did. I thought he died young, about sort of nine years old or something like that. I'm going to go to Google it. Oh, yeah, look, her son succeeded Henry to become Edward VI. Let's click on him. Baby born, 12th of October, 1537. Jane Seymour basically died 12 days later of blood poisoning. And she was married, at, she was uh, buried at Windsor Castle and was later, was joined by Henry. So they buried him with her. Yeah. So they obviously, you know. Also a bit of a burn for Catherine Parr. Bit of a burn for Catherine Parr. And I quite sort of surprised by that because I thought that he kind of, I don't know, the love of his life was really Anne. And that even though he beheaded her and hated her and stuff, that he wouldn't be with any, buried with any of his wives. I don't know why, but I just thought that. But hold on. So Edward VI was King of England and Ireland um, from 1547 until he died. And he was crowned on the 20th of February and he was only nine years old. Oh, wow. When he was crowned. So he was very, very young. Um, and Edward was the first monarch ever to be raised as Protestant. Right. And then he died in 1553. Um... So he didn't have a very long reign or at all. He was really yeah. young when he died. Um, but I'm not sure whether he died... I think he died whilst Henry was still alive. Oh. Did he? I think he, I think he outlived Henry, because otherwise he wouldn't have been crowned. I just thought that maybe Henry got on well or something, but no, okay. How often does Henry VIII chat pop up in your like daily life over the over the years since school mm. have you ever done like a play or have you ever wanted to like i think i, I when the the minute for me anything's on like the tudors or um any films like elizabeth with kate blanchett that kind of thing i'm always really intrigued and drawn to it and i do talk about it quite a lot because of the area that i live in i'm in surrey i was in hampton court before then i moved away and now I'm going back again, so I'm definitely drawn to the place. And it does come up in conversation. I thought, oh, Hampton Court, Henry yeah. VIII. Yeah, and then I start chatting away. Um, and I just sort of uh, reel off his, his wives, and people are like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> and not just the rhyme. Yeah. You know. What is the rhyme? How does so the rhyme, go? the rhyme is divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived. Oh, okay. And, um, and so, yeah, I kind of know a little bit more, but not I'm, I'm by no means, as you, people listening to this will know, I'm no expert. I'm just passionate about the, the psyche of the man. Right, yeah. So it's more the fact that there was this one guy who could do all this, who had the kind of power to do all this and the will. And got and away, got with, away it. with it. Because even now, you just, I don't think you'd get away with that. No, modern modern monarchs could not follow this kind of... No. Kind of line. It sometimes feels like they don't really have that much power anymore. No, I don't think they have that much power anymore. And I think that um, the less they kind of um, separate themselves from everyday people and everyday life, it seems to go against them. And I think that everything's kind of moved and evolved and the royal family for a long time kind of looked at it as a bit like dinosaurs, really, mm. um, for, for not kind of moving with the times. But I do think that... You know, William and Harry and Kate, I think they've really injected a newfound warmth and love for the royal family. Um, and they're more modern and got a more modern take on things. They're much more hands-on. They seem more accessible, more approachable. And I think that they, they kind of need to be like that nowadays. I think before, people wanted the royal family to kind of be a bit out of reach and they kind of represented something quite... Um, far away, quite magical, quite sort of something inspirational. Whereas I think now people are more inspired by the, them getting kind of their hands dirty, if you like, and being have been more involved with the real everyday stuff and talking about everything from, um, you know, the terrorism that we're going through to depression. So, you know, they're talking about absolutely everything, stuff that they would never have been um, associated with before, I think makes people kind of love them more yeah um wrapping up for listeners who are keen to know more mm. um you mentioned the elizabeth film starring kate blanchett because mm. i think adaptations are like a good way of learning history but yeah. passively 
Yes. Where you might not want to sit down and like watch a three hour long documentary about the Tudors, but you might want to watch like a two hour feature film that's got some drama. It's a little dramatised, you know. Yeah. Might, they might take a few liberties with the script, but yeah. you still learn the basics. You still learn the basics and it's um, a way to escape as well. You know, like you say, you're not going to be sitting there kind of going, I've got to know all the facts and, and figures about this. <laughs> you know, you kind of just get swept off in a journey. And I think that sometimes that's the best way to to um, educate kids as well, is yeah. to take them on a journey with it, for them to genuinely love it, to um, for a story to be told with passionate music or a soundtrack or uh, the way it's told is a massive part of why I loved, you know, learning about history at school was because of my teacher. Yeah. And I think that it's... Um, yeah, I think I think it's a it's a well she's a florist now, my history teacher. You're still in touch. <laughs> no, but I just know she's I know she's a florist. She became quite a successful florist, but I um she was brilliant. She was so animated about the stories and very human and emotional. Yeah. Um, which is obviously something as an actress and a singer you kind of you thrive on and you live on and um and I do think that it's so important that you're taught things with that that, that sort of enthusiasm and, and it's contagious. Yeah. You know. The, what, 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 other fil- what other films are there apart from uh, Elizabeth? Oh, God, you, you put me on the spot into? now. You, sorry, if you want to do a Google, we can pause and Let's edit. Let's do a Google, and right. pause, pause and edit, because there's probably loads. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say a great film to watch uh, for Henry VIII is A Man for All Seasons in 1966. It was a brilliant, brilliant film. Um, and there aren't many films of like the mature... Henry VIII, mm. and it, it shows that as well, and it is really, really good. Um, you've got um, another film as well that uh, Kathy Burke was in. Um, uh, she was, I think that was Elizabeth, and I think that was in the late eighties, um, and that was a, that was a really good film. And she was brilliant in that. I think she played Mary in that, and um, she absolutely acted her socks off in it she was absolutely brilliant so that's another good one um let's have a look as well and obviously you've got the tudors um which is you know an, an obese henry a handsome henry it's a more like a sexy BBC kind of henry it's a bbc kind of show right okay um, I don't know if it's if it's BBC. Yeah, it's BBC. I think it sounds BBC. It's making yeah, me think. Yeah, but of I like... know it's um, um, Jonathan Rhys Meyers. Is that his name? How you say it? Yeah, Jonathan Rhys yeah. Meyers. Meyers. Um, he was he was in it, looking gorgeous and making uh, a very lust lustful Henry VIII. You feel like you'd want it. When in actual fact, I don't think Henry was that good looking. Right. Yeah, he wasn't, was he? No. No. Um, he wasn't. He wasn't a looker, really. Um, and then, hold on. Well, there's another one. There was. A, there was a black and white one that I watched. I remember watching that. I loved. Let me just look at that Let me one. Find I it. And then the films about Henry VIII have been being made since, God, forever. Like 1933, you can go back and get films that I remember vaguely seeing. Um, um, you've got the private life of Henry VIII. Um, there's, there's so many you can literally everyone is listening google it and it's just a never ending source of fascination um, there are so many brilliant things that you can watch that have been done now and have been done like I say 30s even before that um, you, you, you'll be spoiled for choice there's just so so many um, but I do remember seeing a black and white one and I can't remember the name of it it's bugging me now I'm going to go and look for that because I remember watching it and loving it um, but for now, you've got enough. You've got okay. enough to be doing. If you if you remember, let us know, and we'll stick yeah. it on the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Thank you so much. Thanks. I've never had a conversation about Henry VIII publicly before. <laughs> In a full way. Eh? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for helping me along. No, I really mine enjoyed more, it. Mine was more the passion <laughs> than the factual thing. So you helped me with a few things, and <laughs> I learned some stuff today. <laughs> Which is always good. It it's always did, good to did learn mostly more. come from Wikipedia though, so... Oh, did it? Yeah. Ah, you cheat. <laughs> a huge thanks to Martine. You have been listening to Talk The Line. I'm Jen Long, original music by Seams. Please do subscribe to this podcast if you like what you hear. We've got a new one every Friday. And please leave us a review as well. It really helps us out. You can follow us on Twitter at Talk The Line. See you next week.